Alright, this video or these next couple videos are going to be a little bit different than what you're used to. My uh, writing stylus is not working very well, so let's rock and roll. So, by characteristics of polynomial functions, a polynomial, fu polynomial function is in the form of f of x equals a n x power of n plus a n minus 1 x power of n minus 1 all the way all to a x1 plus a o. Basically, that just mean all that that's meaning is that all the ends, so all the exponents, have to be whole numbers. And whole numbers are talked about 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. x is the variable, and the coefficients, so all the numbers in front of the variables, just have to be real numbers. We're not going to be dealing with any kind of non-real numbers, so we're not going to be dealing with complex or imaginaries. So as long as the number in front actually makes sense. It's like, you can still take the square root of 2, still a number. Just, we're not, we're still not going to deal with those ones, but as long as the numbers in front are real numbers. Like 2, so 2 is the number in front, our variable is x, the exponent is 1. 2x plus 1 is a polynomial function. Or x power 3, add 5x squared, subtracting 3x, add 6. That's another polynomial function. The degree of a polynomial function is in one variable x is n. Basically, whatever the highest exponent is, is what's known as the degree. A form of the greatest power. Of course, if someone else from another country or something is what is watching this, there's slightly different rule if you have two variables in the exact same term, but as part of Saskatchewan curriculum, we don't have to really worry about that. So degree is just the highest power. The coefficient is of the greatest power of x, so basically the number that has that highest power is known as the leading to coefficient. And a term whose value is not affected by the var variable is a constant term. It's typically, it's more simply known as a y-intercept, but it's always going to be the number without a variable. And there are going to be some times where the number without a variable is literally the number zero. So in our first example, we're going to identify whether they're polynomial functions, just find the answer. And if they are polynomial, we're going to state what the degree is, leading coefficient, and constant term. So 1 over x, another way that that can be rewritten is it's x to the power of negative 1. So this one is not poly polynomial because the exponent of negative 1 is not a whole number. Whole numbers only are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so on and so forth. Our second one, 3x squared subtracting 2x to the power of 5 adding 4, is polynomial. And its degree is 5. It is the highest power of x. The leading coefficient is whatever the number is in front of that highest power, which is negative 2. And our constant term is 4. See, yes, this is also polynomial because we have coefficients, all of our exponents are whole numbers, and x is our variable. Our exponent of 4 is that highest power, so that would be our degree. Our leading coefficient would be this negative 4, not this negative 4, this one, and our constant term is 3. This one is not polynomial because our exponent is 1 half. Another way that this could be written is this would actually be, um, and I'm trying to, okay, it's not going to write the nicest, I'm trying to write with the computer. This would be the same as the square root of x. This is not polynomial. It is a radical function, which in pre-calc 30 we'll be talking about a little bit later. But this is, the exponent is 1 half. It is not a whole number. Now, determining leading term, degree, leading coefficient, constant term, of following polynomial functions. Uh, apparently I need to still put a little bit of space in here, but that's just kind of a note for myself. To determine leading leading term, if we have just individual fa uh, factors here, all we're really going to be concerned with is what are the 
first terms. What are the power? What are the terms that have the highest degrees in each factor? So in this case, we have the 2x, x cubed, and the negative x squared. Yes, technically this should have a 2 in front of it, but we're really only caring about what the x's are because that's going to be the only thing that that's going to determine what our degree is. Uh, apparently part of my notes I forgot about the leading term. Well, we'll kind of quickly talk about that anyways. Uh, our degree, because this is an x, this is an x cubed, and this is an x squared, our degree would be 6. Because 1, 3, and 2, same base, multiplying, we add the exponents, it adds to be 6. The leading coefficient would be the number in front. So similarly, like we just did here, x by the x cubed by the negative x squared, we're just looking at what the numbers in front of them are. In this case, 2, 1, and negative 1, which gives us the negative 2. If we look for what the actual first term is, it would just be a negative 2, which would be the leading coefficient, x to the power of 6. That would be what the leading term would be. And I'm just taking that leading coefficient using my variable x and putting the degree of 6. Our constant term, just like we found out what our degree and our leading coefficient would be, all we're going to be concerned with is what are the numbers that don't have variables. So in this case, the negative 3, positive 5, and the positive 1. If you multiply those together, our constant term would be negative 15. In our second example, we're going to do this very similar, similar format. To find out our degree, and we'll talk about leading term, leading term after everything, x cubed is our highest power in this one. In this one, 2x minus 1 to the power 4 just means that we'd have this 2x minus 1 four times. So we have actually four 2x's as part of our term here. Same thing here, we'd have eight x's here. So by adding up our terms, or adding, sorry, adding up the exponents, three, this would be a 2x power four, which would be a uh, 16 x to the power four, and an x to the power of eight, three, four, and eight would give us 15. Similar way to find out our leading coefficient, the one in front of our x cubed would be one. The two would be raised to the power of four, which would give us that highest power in this factor, and the 1 to the power of 8 here would give us the highest power in this factor. When you multiply all that together, you get 16. So our leading term would be a 16x to the power of 15. And to find out our constant term, well, we'll have to find out what are, the, what are each of the constant terms in each of these factors? Just like we had done over here with the negative 3, the 5, and 1, this first factor, this x to the power 3, does not have any constant term, which actually means it could be rewritten as x to the power 3 at 0. So our constant term is actually 0 here. Similarly, negative 1 to the power 4 and 2 to the power of 8. But we also know that anything multiplied by 0 is just going to be 0, and we're done. Obviously, we're not filling out the other potentially 14 other or 15 other terms. We're just talking about what's leading, leading coefficient or leading term and what the con, a constant term is. Then we start talking about what are known as the characteristics of polynomial functions. So we're going to bring back this, this uh, information in section four. But we're not going to be doing that, obviously, for another two full sections. So this is section one. Overall, all polynomial functions will follow a very kind of set pattern on how they are. Now, they will continue going on and on, because depending on what the middle terms are, they will be either very wonky or spread out or anything like that, which will change the way that it's going to look. But on this page, we're going to talk about three specific types. We're talking about a degree one, which is linear, a degree three, which is known as a cubic, and a degree five, which is a quintic. You'll notice that all three of these are odd degrees. The black graphs are the ones that are the positive graphs. Notice in each of these, linear obviously is degree one, cubic is degree three, and quintic is degree five. If we're talking about the maximum number of x-intercepts, 
for a linear, it would have a maximum of, a maximum of one. It doesn't matter where this line would be, it would have a maximum of one. A cubic, a maximum, where again, we're only care, right now we're only caring about a maximum. And this one, you can see that this has three. But if this graph were to somehow move up, you can notice that there's one, two x intercepts. If it further moves up, you notice that it still has one. Even if this goes completely off the grid, we know that that arrow means it's going to continue extending down, which means it's always still going to have that one. But for our understanding of right now, we just need to have to talk about what the maximum would be. And similarly, with a quintic, which is a degree five, it has a maximum of five x. One, two, three, four, five. It doesn't matter where it is. Right there, there's one, two, and let's move that up just a tiny bit to actually see it nicely. Let's move up there. One, two, three, four. I move further up, one, two, three. If I move even further, there's two x-intercepts, and that would be one. Obviously, I could still move things down, but it's still going to follow that same same pattern, that's those same characteristics. It has a maximum of what those degrees are. Now, the end behavior is one of those kind of sticky things. Remembering back to pre-calc 20, where we talked about our quadrants, quadrant one, two, three, and four. The black graphs on each of these are positive odd degrees. So you notice that they're always, each and every single one of them, start down in quadrant three, and they always end up in quadrant one. So when it is a positive, it's starting in quadrant three and ending in quadrant one. I don't care whether you use the alphanumeric or if you use Roman numerals. Roman numerals kind of look nicer, but I really don't care. As long as you're writing that a positive odd degree goes from three to one, you're set. Whereas if we look at the red graphs, these are the graphs that are always starting up in quadrant two, and they're always ending down in quadrant four. It doesn't matter whether, obviously, this would actually not be going back this way, it would kind of be spreading out to the left, but it still would be starting up in quadrant three, or sorry, quadrant two, and ending down in quadrant four. That's why I just drew these arrows. That doesn't matter whether it's linear, cubic, or quintic. That will be its behavior. Our domain. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's linear, cubic, or quintic. Our domain is all real numbers. It extends to the left, extends to the right. All of these graphs. And the range, it also, also will always extend down and up because of those arrows. So, for those reasons, our x is an element of the real numbers and our y is an element of the real numbers. When we go on to the even ones, so a degree zero, degree two, or degree four, it's going to change, obviously, because all the odds and evens are different. You can notice what these graphs look like. Degree zero is known as a constant term. Degree two is a quadratic, which is one of those big things that we had talked about in pre-calc 20. And degree four is a quartic. So that's one of the new ones. You notice in our notes, I kind of have end up here that for if you're planning on taking foundation 30, the degree three is where it ends. We just kind of talked about constant, linear, quadratic, and cubic. The quintic and the quartic, which is the degree four, is the new stuff for pre calc 30. So now let's look at those same characteristics. Obviously, we're going to identify what the degrees are pretty quick. But if we look at our x intercepts, so it's on this one, this black graph here, it has one, two, three, four, which still fits with that same kind of characteristics of what a, what about the odd degrees? A quadratic has a maximum of two. But if I were to move this graph up, actually grab it, this one has one, or it could potentially have zero x Again, all that we really care about until we get into section four, where we're going to talk about factors and how they relate to the graphs, is that we just kind of care about what's the maximum that I can have. So, 
a degree zero is a little bit special because you can see that degree zero here does not have any x intercepts. But if your function were to lay straight on your x axis, it could potentially have an infinite amount of x intercepts. Not going to cause too many trick questions like that on, for you. That's for other classes. Or we mainly, we really, we only kind of work with mainly the linear or all the way to the cubic, or sorry, quartic. Ah, quintic. Sorry. Now, if we look at the end behavior, once again, the black graphs are the positive functions. You notice that each of them are going from quadrant two to quadrant one, reading always from left to right, quadrant two, quadrant one. Quadrant two, yes, it goes through quadrant three and quadrant four, but it always still ends up in quadrant one. Whereas if we look at our red graphs, they are always going to be starting in quadrant three and ending in quadrant four. Three, even though this one doesn't look like it, it's still, that arrow means it's going to still end down in quadrant four. This graph is just saying this is a quartic, but it doesn't even cross the x-axis. So the end behavior, two to one for positives, three to four for negatives. Our domain, just like the odd degrees, our domain is all real numbers, but that's the kind of one of the key characteristics of polynomial functions, that it is going to be all real numbers. Whereas if we look at the range, notice how each and every single one of these graphs, the range, which again talks about our y values, is different for each of these. So for the range, it really depends. So just to summarize all of this into one quick graph or one quick chart, we have evens and we have odds. So within each, we have positive and negatives. For a positive odd function, all of their end behavior always talk about three to one. Whereas an odd function that's negative always starts in quadrant two and ends in quadrant four. The way that I like thinking about it is start thinking about a line. A positive line looks like that. It goes up. It ends up. That's one of the other th big things that all these positives always end up. But if I think about a positive line, it looks like this. It starts in quadrant three and would end in quadrant one. Whereas if I change this to be a negative line, which odd, negative, it would start off in quadrant four or quadrant two and end down in quadrant four. For even functions, I like thinking about parabolas because even positive functions start in quadrant two and end in quadrant one. I'm just going to get rid of that. Draw a different graph. My parabola would start off in quadrant two and end in quadrant one. Whereas if I have a negative parabola, it would start down in quadrant three and end down in quadrant four. So if I can just think about lines and parabolas, I'm set, I'm golden. Last but not least, our last page on this section, we're just gonna determine a quadrant that begins and finishes, where we're gonna talk about what the end behavior. We can see in this question, our highest power is 15. That's what our degree is. And 15 is odd. The number in front of that x bar 15 is a positive number. So if it's odd and positive, odd means I think about a line, and then I have to think about what does a positive line look like? Well, that just means it's gonna start down in quadrant three and end in quadrant one. Uh, this was just a typo. I don't think I even have even fixed that yet, which I'm gonna have to do as soon as I'm done my video. But our highest power here is eight. Or sorry, eh. I don't know why I'm thinking eight. 10, which is an even number. It is negative in front of that, which means I'm going to think about a negative parabola, which starts in quadrant three and ends in quadrant four. To find out my degree here, this is an x power of eight. This is two x to the power of five. Eight and five gives me 13. Notice how this negative two does not have any exponent on it. 
or sorry, any variable on it, so I don't have, have to worry about it. It's an odd function, so I'm, I know that immediately I'm going to think about a line to find out whether it's positive or negative. This 2x is positive. Well, 2 x to the power of 5 is still going to be positive. An x to the power of 8, a positive x, is still going to be positive. Of course, if it was negative, then we'd have 5 negative, then that would be negative, but we're going to cross that bridge when we get there. That negative 2 automatically makes it negative. So for a negative odd, I think about a negative line. A negative line starts in quadrant 2 and ends in quadrant 4. The last bit is talking about what the characteristics are, and we're going to match some equations to graphs. Uh, as part of our notes for this year, I believe that what we did is we looked at the graphs and kind of matched them to the equations. So if we looked at quadrant or the first graph, basically we, what we need to do is when we do this matching, we have to have an understanding of this. We need to determine whether it's going to be even or odd, what the end behavior would be, the number of possible x-intercepts, and what the y-intercept would be. So we look at this first graph, we can see that we have one, two, three, four, five x-intercepts. Well, automatically, that's going to reduce our chances from a degree four, degree three, degree four. It would just put us at here, our C as our answer. Now, just to make sure that everything else matches, we see that it is negative. It is behaving like a negative line. So that negative line means it's going to be going down. And it's odd, and we're set. Uh, we'll talk about the y-intercept in just a second. I like talking about that one at the very end. If we go to graph 2, we can see that it's going up. It's behaving like a positive line here. And that positive line, starting down in quadrant 3 and ending in quadrant 1, means that we're going to have to ah, we are going to have to have an odd, which fits with question or equation B. Odd, and it's positive. So there's our set. Graph number three. I'm just going to get rid of that for right now. Yeah, it'll actually go bye bye. We can see that it's starting down in quadrant three and it's ending down in quadrant four. So overall, it is behaving like a negative parabola. The only equation that behaves like a negative parabola, negative, even, will be A. Obviously, by process of elimination, 4 would be D, but let's double check it. It is behaving like a positive parabola, starting up in quadrant 2 and ending in quadrant 1, which fits exactly with a positive odd function. The last thing I do like talking about is just this idea about the y-intercept. So if we look at C, our constant term, we had in our notes, the constant term is our y-intercept, it's a number without a variable. So if I look at our graph here, our y-intercept here, really hard to see, but it's zero which is exactly what the constant term for this function would be. A add zero, it is a number without a variable. It's just a number zero. Here, let's see if it matches. B, yeah, it does look like our y-intercept is positive three. Sometimes you have to use all of our characteristics. It's even or oddness, it's positive or negativeness, and that y-intercept to determine whether we have or which graph is going to be which. See, uh, see here, no, oh, that would be negative 10. We're looking at about negative four or so. Yeah, that's what A is, our y-intercept of negative four. Again, by process of elimination, we know immediately that our y-intercept should be negative 12. And does it look like it? Yeah. Right. There is our section one. We can have some fun.